Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Gulf Intelligence Daily Energy Markets Forum, Wednesday, January 20th. I believe that's a day when there is a new president uh, sworn into the United States of America. My bottle of champagne is is is, is off camera here. Um, no, uh, no bias. Nonetheless, um, it is a new dawn, uh, regardless of uh, all things. Um, so here we are uh, reviewing the market open in Asia. Uh, and um, again, we're going through a week in which we're bouncing a little up, bouncing a little down, uh, sticking at Brent around 55. Let's kick off with uh, regular commentator Matt Stanley, director of Star Fuels, who I notice is not in a chicken outfit, but surely, surely we're going to have to get some heavies. Oh, OK, that, that'll do. That'll do. That gets us close. That's, Is that all right? I'll settle for that. I'll settle for that. Okay, Matt, um, your thoughts on the market open uh, this week, this year, uh, and trends looking forward? Well, I mean, it's been, we've kind of been stuck in a bit of a range on Brent for the last 10 days, two weeks, something like that. Uh, we're getting close to 60. I wouldn't be surprised if we hit that the week of the dollar gets. It seems that that's kind of the rhetoric at the moment is is dollar weakness. I think that that's a good thing, like your mate, Grandpa Joe's come, gonna be sworn in later on. I think that funds are piling out of the dollar as a safe haven that it's been for the last six months and getting into the riskier assets. They're, they're getting more confident about um, other parts of the economy globally. So yeah, look, we're up 40 cents this morning. The one thing that's really been, for me, that has been the key in the last couple of weeks has been refining margins and their strength. Uh, gasoline is up. It's up about 40% in the last two weeks. Gas oil is doing very well. And, and the, the best performing part of the barrels, Russ Edwards loves me saying every single time, is the low sulfur fuel oil. It's been extraordinary strong. And so that, those, like would, those distillate indicators would tell you that literal demand must be strong. I mean, on the on the sentiment side, you're saying crude might be getting up to 60 because of weak dollar, because of maybe yeah. non-fundamental reasons, but the distillates are looking strong because demand must be strong. Yeah, demand is certainly is certainly there. It's, it's been a little hesitant this week, but it's certainly stronger than it was. Um, I think it's just a general across the barrel. Uh, people are, are a lot more confident. Um, 0.5 demand has been dragged up because of the strength in LNG. So the fundamentals are certainly there. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out across the barrel over the course of the next couple of weeks. Well, we'll come back to Matt with some of his sort of longer term outlook for the year ahead and, 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 and get into that. But let's move uh, to the beautiful city of Beirut, uh, where Lori Hatayan is sitting, our MENA director, Natural Resource Governance Institute. It's a mouthful. I keep saying it. I want an acronym. This is the NRGI. year of acronyms. <laughs> Laurie, uh, your thoughts on, on, the, on the year to date and, and where the market is trending? Well, uh, you see, again, like when we come to demand, we see like a lot of uncertainties again. All these news about uh, new lockdowns, uh, new uh, COVID cases in, in, in uh, I guess, in China. Uh, and these new, uh, and new news that we're hearing that uh, don't move, don't go to, your, to see your, your family on the New Year, the uh, new, uh, Lunar New Year. Like this is all something that we heard last year in 2020. And we thought that would be the end of it with the vaccine and the vaccination. But seeing all of that, it's putting a lot of pressure again on the on demand and the uncertainty on demand. So you are controlling supply and OPEC, OPEC plus is controlling supply. But again, all these uncertainties, I guess, will be something that will stay with us at least until uh, mid-year, right? Because there again, all analysts are saying mid-year on everything will be fine. Life will go back to normal. It's saying that what we said in 2020 with vaccine, once we have the vaccine, everything will be fine again and we'll have a normal life. And it seems that this is not the, the case. Plus, uh, we've heard a lot about 2021 being the recovery year, right? So that's why everybody wants to be cautious and not, not over optimistic. And I guess this is it. Like, uh, let's not be very optimistic uh, and let's see how this recovery will happen. Uh, but from all the analysts uh, that I'm hearing, reading, 
2021 is the uh, transition year, hoping that 2022 life will come back to normal. So this is one. The second, I think uh, for us in the region, at least, everybody is uh, waiting to see what Biden will do with Iran, uh, what Biden will do in the region. And so that is another thing that is important for us in the region. I guess what we are hearing now, uh, and yesterday we've heard it a lot, saying that uh, everybody in the region should be sitting around the table to discuss uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, an agreement with Iran. It's not an, a US uh, European issue. It is like directly involving the region and the region has the priority to sit on the table and to discuss what this deal it means because it's not only about economy, it's about like stability in the region. And uh, if, if, if some parties in the region don't feel uh, safe, so they need to sit on the table and have a say on it. And I think it is the right path to go. It's not only about the ballistic missiles. It's not only about Iran coming back to, uh, to the market, to the uh, to energy market. It is about um, a peace deal that, uh, that the region needs peace. Now with all this rapprochement between the Gulf and Israel and other, other Arab countries. Maybe it's the right path to stability, but we still need more uh, to come definitely to Palestinian issue and definitely uh, like bringing Iran to the table with everybody to discuss how we, we should move on. And then that will bring economic stability definitely, but security is important as well. I suppose, I saw... you, you've seen what happened with all these uh, uh, incidents in the Gulf, in the... Uh, in the uh, uh, Strait of Hormuz, etc. So this is something that we don't need, at least in the region, because it will affect energy and oil and gas. And with all the uncertainties, we don't we need a bit of stability in the region, I guess, that will affect and, the energy market. And it certainly wouldn't do the Gulf any harm to have access to a, a, a market with 100 million consumers, as is the case with Iran sitting 100 miles away. Um, Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Bora Barryman, managing partner, Homer's Strait uh, Partnership. Bora, it's the same old story, isn't it, really? It's all about printing as much money as you can. 1.9 trillion now is the next thing. A clear path in front of, um, in front of the Biden administration with the Senate and the House. And, and markets are just going to, you know, don't fight the Fed, don't fight the, the, the printing presses. It's, it's all markets up on a very simple thing, which is more, more, more stimulus. Absolutely. Um, you know what uh, Janet Yellen uh, po poised to take over the uh, Secretary of Treasury role uh, emphasized yesterday is that um, the Fed, the Treasury needs to think big, right? Um, as if they haven't been thinking big. I mean, there's a there's a contrast with Trump clearly there because he would have said, think bigly. So uh, the message is unconventional monetary policy is the new conventional monetary policy. You know, the authorities are going to take, do whatever it takes. And that actually does give uh, and, quite a bit of But the other part of that puzzle is not only are the unemployed uh, construction workers in Oklahoma looking for their 600 bucks, but Wall Street billionaires are also demanding that they get their stimulus. Uh, this is as much a Wall Street thing as it is uh, an unemployed construction worker. Yes, I'm um, actually more optimistic about Wall Street, honestly, than for the construction worker. But uh, of course, the, uh, the, the political authorities are giving us the impression that, um, that they're, they're going to get these stimulus checks out to everyone, which is good. That's everyone in the United States. Maybe stepping not back. Not to us. We exactly. won't be not, getting not, a check. Not, not to us. I mean, I congratulate you. you, 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 you you're going to get that warm glow of an Irish president, right? But I don't know what else we'll get other than that uh, warm glow. Well, as long as he keeps quoting the great Irish poets, you know, who else, you know, what else matters? Exactly. But the markets are optimistic. Um, the, the, the bank indices are up um, more than 11% since the beginning of the year. That's one of the best performing sectors. You've seen um, the, uh, the leading US banks uh, releasing loan loss provisions, but, I want to emphasize that um, actually 
they're not releasing loan loss provisions on credit card debt. So that's, I think, the construction worker side of the equation, right? They're releasing loan loss provisions to other Fortune 500 type uh, systemically important companies that are able to access debt, that are able to kick the can down the road. And uh, there's quite a bit of optimism that, um, you know, with the central bank support and the rollout of the vaccines, um, and basically the, the message from the Fed that corporate debt is not going to default, there is appetite for it, at least on the, their balance sheet. Yields will stay at record, record lows, um, and debt will not be um, as risky, right? Because debt is risky to the extent that it cannot be serviced, but to the extent that you can generate a 0% return on your debt and service it, fine. Um, um, Is there any outlook at some point, and it's, it's sort of near-term, mid-term horizon for inflation? Well, you know, a phrase that I've been seeing uh, more frequently, and I'm going to start repeating it uh, here for the first time is, you know, we can't talk about a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery or an L-shaped recovery. I think we're, we're living the future now, which is a K-shaped recovery. Some people have recovered and they're going to continue to do very well. And these are the globalized sectors, the digitized sectors, and then others, um, especially the hospitality industry, this is the, the these are our pro, modern day proletariat, right? Who works in factories in the OECD countries? Very few people. But these people will continue to be reliant on um, assistance, and and I, I, I'm you can see that there's um, let's say um, political difficulty will be generated from that segment of the population, whether it's. Uh, left-wing pressure on the Biden administration, right? Because he's going to have a lot of pressure from what's called today the progressives, right? But basically, it's more kind of a statist, interventionist uh, wing of his party. And, uh, and then you'll have the populist side, which is also basically the same people, right? They've just been sliced and diced into different directions. And globally, you'll see these type of... Um, obviously um, pressures, whether it's in Nigeria or India from, from people who are, who are perhaps, um, I, I can see it now, people are a bit disturbed that the commodity prices have recovered so well because the cost of energy is going up and the cost of uh, food commodities is going up. So that is an inflationary pressure that is um, uh, felt at the bottom rungs, right? But how much does food and energy account for that overall inflation uh, basket that is measured by the central banks when they're targeting, you know, their interest rate setting? I so, suppose uh, that that uh, match is bringing you back in on that point the, 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 that you mentioned. The weak dollar is is in a sense the underpinning to be for the uh, emerging economies to be able to consume. Uh, the energy costs that are being, the commodity costs that are rising uh, uh, with the weak dollar, it makes it uh, viable. But is, is that sustainable, do you think? Weak well, dollar, strong energy, or if the dollar strengthens, energy comes off. What's your outlook for that sort of synergy? Well, it comes to a point, and there's always this this pivot point where you 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 d there's a certain amount of demand destruction the higher the end user prices get. And like Boris said, it's, it's been an extraordinary rally we've seen on Brent. Fundamentally, was it, who was it driven by? You could argue it was driven by the funds because they've been given such cheap money to invest in whatever they feel like they can invest in. So there will come a point where it's, it's those who are, and I made this point the other week, it's those who are economically able and active to provide the uptick in demand. And are they going to, run out and get in their car and go and to a lovely restaurant or go to the seaside when everything reopens again. I don't think so. I think the world is a lot more cautious. And the, the, the fracturing of 
who is investing in the market is basically Wall Street versus everyone else. And the, the, the other serious, the other interesting point is, is the recovery in demand is literally split east of Suez versus west of the Suez. Asia has been incredible. China, you know, they've seen some cases rise, but I mean, it's gone from what, one to maybe four or something. It's not, it's nothing compared to what Western Europe is going through. And I think once Grandpa, get, Grandpa Joe gets inaugurated later on, there will be his first, the first item on the agenda is, is controlling COVID. And I think that that will have an effect on, on uh, products, imports and demand. But what, what does it mean for flat price? Look, as long as Wall Street continue get to get cheap money, we will see commodities, you know, go the other way. So it's... I mean, if we take the um, underpinning to the K or B or L or whichever one it is, uh, and I would concur with the K is very much 2020, um, but underpinning all of them is the China recovery of 2020. Uh, and yeah. and uh, you dismiss the, 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 the current picture out of, of, of China a little flippantly there as we might have all done a year ago but i would take note that there's over three cities within 100 miles of beijing that amount to a population of close to 30 million people that are in a chinese hermetically sealed wuhan type lockdown not a london go to have your cappuccino type lockdown uh, and we have uh, the also the the reality of the lunar new year coming up in which mm. A lot of oil, uh, a lot of energy uh, has been uh, accumulated in order to facilitate what would be normally four or 500 million people taking a journey that are now going to be coming, it would appear under very tight restrictions to make those journeys. I mean, adding all that together uh, and with the new Arsenal variant of the um, of the COVID uh, from 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 the southeast of England or wherever it might be, but my point is, Matt, what do you think that could potentially add up to from a China demand point of view? You seem not so much at the moment. I mean, yeah, look, I wasn't I wasn't being dismissive in you know in, in the rising cases, but what they it's certainly a case of once bitten twice shy, and they have the ability now. You know, Shanghai is is, is the financial hub in in China. I deal with a lot of people there. They have the ability to switch from office working to home working, and that transition is seamless. I think they have adjusted quicker than anyone else, whether that be uh, the way that it, it enforcement is going through. China is a lot different to Western Europe. Um, it, you know, it doesn't take it a rocket scientist to, to work that out. It's the Lunar New Year. Yeah, of course, there's always increased spending uh, during that time. That was covered in probably December. So we're now next. We're now into the next trading wave, and I think that there is a touch of hesitation as we come into sort of the March trading cycle now, because uh, you know Fe you think it's the middle of Feb, twelfth of February. I think is Chinese New Year. It, it's obviously going to be dampened. You know, Singapore's not doing any parades. Hong Kong are not doing any parades. There's no fireworks. Uh, Beijing and Shanghai will be muted. So yeah, look, if there is an example of how demand has had an effect on global oil and people's appetite to get out and about i think it's fairly well reflected in how chinese new year will be celebrated yeah i think it's certainly one to watch uh laurie let's talk a little bit about opec uh we had obviously the the big decision a week or two ago in terms of uh the 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 sort of q1 plan everybody gets to increase a little bit but saudi arabia agrees to cut a lot uh, I'm wondering what do you interpret from that and what is your outlook for the, 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 the unity of that decision making? So I think like now seeing what's happening at least with the first quarter and all these new lockdowns and all these new developments uh, that are uh, controlling even like the good news of vaccination and everybody getting excited about vaccination. So I think that like, it was the right decision uh, to uh, not to add the 500,000 barrels that we were expecting that will be added to February as part of the deal that in, Jan in December when they said they will add 500 in January and then continue adding until April so that they covered the two, 2 million that were supposed to come uh, to the market. Uh, so I think now looking at what's happening, so maybe it was the right decision. 
I guess Saudi Arabia took everything on their shoulders and did it on their own because of because they didn't want to end up in the same situation like last year in February, March, when they couldn't agree with Russia, and then you know that what happened uh, uh, dramatically. So they. So does that, that give you confidence that the OPEC Plus is in a good, healthy place starting 21, or does it give you any pause for concern that? those fractures between Russia and Saudi could still be present? So I think everybody learned a lesson from last year and how they should behave. And I think that will continue for a certain extent. And now, uh, uh, of course, everybody's happy because Saudi Arabia took that on their shoulder. And I think like the, 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 pr the prices of oil that we're seeing is a direct implication of the 1 million uh, uh, barrels that were cut by Saudi Arabia. Like, because what's, what's the reason like one of the main reasons is that for the for the high price and for the price going up to fifty seven dollars, almost everybody now is talking. Yeah, sixty dollars is possible. When we were saying that, oh, it will be like fifty five dollars and it will not go up, uh, upper the, uh, 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 more than that. So I think yes, there is a responsibility that Saudi Arabia is playing, but it is playing because it needs the high prices right, because it needs cash, that will make Iraq happy, that will make all the countries that need the money and the cash, they will make them happy. And R Russia, I guess, got what they wanted, at least with this uh, flexibility, at least. Going forward, yes, it requires more discipline if the situation continues to deteriorate like this. So, but I think that everybody got the right lesson that collaboration with when there is a big crisis, such as this crisis, collaboration is the way to go so they will continue until like i guess like there will be crisis and they will manage the crisis we'll see but for yeah. now i think there 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 is solidarity and understanding let's go to the survey question which is sort of touching on the situation in china and what the view in the room is in terms of uh, to be concerned from demand point of view. China has been reporting 100 plus cases, most of them locally tra transmitted for over a week. Uh, th that's 100 plus cases per day. The highest number since the initial outbreak was contained in Wuhan in March. Do you expect these developments to negatively impact China's Q1 oil demand? Everybody gets to give us their views on that. Bora, I wanted to uh, give everybody the chance to sort of look a little bit down the horizon for 2021, as this is the first session we're all together. And I've been asking each of our commentators this week to sort of give sort of that, that horizon look. Um, as a kickoff to that, Bora, I'd, I'd welcome your views on the recent sort of rapprochement with Qatar. Uh, and generally what that means for the likes of Fujera, which obviously pre the, the standoff of Qatar, Fujera was a major uh, bunkering center for the Qatar LNG fleet. So I'm just wondering, looking at the rapprochement in Qatar on a macro level for the region, as well as specifically for Fujera. Well, we can say clearly that uh, Fujera wasn't helped by the um, limitations to deal with neighbors, especially Qatar, uh, especially Qatar. There was a lot of business between Fujairah and Qatar, but uh, of course, Fujairah is 100% aligned with the policy of the United Arab Emirates. And um, to, you know, to the extent that the, these initial goodwill steps um, are followed through with more of a coordination of policies, or at least sort of a respectful acknowledgement of each uh, uh, the various parties' self-interest and trying to align the, the GCC members um, more than they have been aligned uh, over the past five years. I'm I I I, I see uh, Fujera benefiting from from that. I'd be curious of, to see if uh, the Qatar LNG fleet has created other uh, other sir, other places in which to service its requirements, or whether they will see a value in returning to Fujairah. For, for example, look, look at Fujairah. Um, it has been uh, a host of investment from from a number of of, uh, of nations, right? Capital from China, capital from uh, Saudi Arabia. American capital, Dutch capital, 
um, Kuwaiti capital, and, and clearly there will be um, interest to uh, host investments from K Qatari uh, investors. And th th there are natural sort of logistical links, uh, uh, whether it be uh, Fujera's role as a jet fuel hub or other uh, road fuels, et cetera. There are so many kind of um, blend permutations that can take place and, and serve the Qatari market. Um, that's the prospect, right? But that needs to be that needs to be realized. Yeah. I, and I'm not I'm not sure whether you know the, uh, the the policies on the ground are reflecting the policies at the summits. So we'll 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 need to ensure that that is the case. But overall, I would be uh, optimistic. Yeah. For In terms of any other uh, outlook for 2021, any particular trend you want to point to, any issue you'll be watching? Well, clearly, you know. Um, Bottom line, the world in 2020 consumed um, 91 million barrels of oil per day. And I think that's an impressive number, right? It's down from the 100 million uh, previously, but it's an impressive number. And to maintain that number does um, require investment into the oil and gas sector. That's where we can see from your news digest that Halliburton is feeling optimistic. And I believe the only thing that can kind of uh, blow that out of the water is probably uh, what, what, what you alluded to, some black swan from China, because China has been growing 2.3% um, in 2020, which is a fantastic achievement, and 7% uh, in the Q4. So to the extent that there's a, a, a disconnection between that momentum and, 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 and the future, trend, there is risk on the oil price to the extent that I think China and East Asia in general uh, keeps a, a lid, a control on the spread of the virus, which they should be. They've got the vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I they think certainly that, have the uh, logistical capability, yeah, yes. which they've demonstrated. Then we, we could see this um, potentially upward volatility in oil as these kind of, I would say, bottlenecks may emerge if if uh, growth is sort of greater than anticipated. Yeah, Matt, your thoughts uh, for the any big trend issue to to keep an eye on for twenty twenty one? Will jet fuel be back? What's the horizon for you on these issues? I just want to touch on the Qatari yeah. uh, discussion you just made. I, I, those in the know. And I don't profess to be in one of them all the time, some of the time. Uh, I don't think we'll see Qatar gas come back in the bunker market in Fujairah until at least July, something like that. There's obviously some um, patching up of relationships to do. Uh, Fujairah is certainly the litmus test for that in terms of bunker volumes. But, you know, obviously they had to find, they had to mitigate, you know, where they were going to lift those bunkers from. They've been lifting other, other ports across the world. So I think it will take time before we see an aggregation of that volume back in Fujairah. But I think it will. So Q3 onwards, we could hopefully see a sort of 15 to 20% uptick in bunker volumes from the Qataris. So it's a good thing for Fujairah. Mm -hmm. uh, going forward, I think there's a few things, Sean, to be honest. Product side, you know, it was a fascinating thing on the radio this morning regarding IATA passports or, you know, these travel passports and what do they mean is, is there going to be a, an endorsement from the World Health Organization regarding one specific vaccine? Is that going to provide the uptick in demand that, that jet fuel is so craving? Because it's still the dog of the barrel, to be honest. But gas oil has been so strong and distillates have been strong. So it's, it's, it's been relatively mitigated by those two. Uh, the one thing I think over the next week or so everyone's going to be looking at is what Biden does regarding US energy policy. If we hear any mutings of that, that's going to be key. Obviously, we know he's going to go back into the Paris Accord. Halliburton obviously had a good Q4 because rigs have been, you know, people have been able to lock in, you know, where are we on WTI now? 53, 41, and it's pretty consistent throughout the curve in 2021 at 53. That allows US oil producers to hedge those, hedge those volumes, allows them to look at their balance sheet a lot closer and become ever more efficient in how they produce. I do think we will see US oil production drop off Drop off. But I think it will. I think it will decrease. And I from think where it is now, I mean, it's yeah. down two million from a year ago. 
Correct. We're about 11 now. I wouldn't be surprised if we went down to about 10. I don't see the investment getting into that shale patch uh, anytime soon. I think it's been a, you know, the, the flat price rally has made those, the likes of Parsley and those brilliant names they give themselves, Coriander or whatever they're called, have allowed them to, to lock in values, consolidate down and protect their balance sheet. And I think that's going to be the key thing in 2021. But all eyes on Biden and Iran. I think Iran has, you know, as Laurie said, that is really key for the market. It's not just crude and it's not just products. It's the grade of crude that the market is, is, is looking for. And let's bear in mind that they own one of the biggest shipping fleets in the world. Freight is already uh, weak. Russ Edwards, again, I've referred back to him for the third time today. You must think that there's, there's an issue that I've got with him or something. Are you, are you at the point, is it the time of year where you renew your contract with... Uh, <laughs> with uh, I've been waiting four Europe. months. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but yeah, so it's what happens to freight as well. Fundamentally, I think it's a bullish year for oil. And you know me, Sean, I've been Winnie the Pooh for the last 22 years now. I've been in this oil market. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm bullish Ish. Don't fight the Fed. Um, before we give Laurie the last word, let's see the result of the survey, what the view in the room is on the outlook for China. Uh, do you expect this to negatively impact China's Q1 oil demand, 57 to 43? Sort of close enough, I suppose, that the, uh, the Bulls have won the answer to that question. Laurie, your closing thoughts and sort of horizon outlooks, and it wouldn't be uh, complete without a reference to the East Med. Yeah, definitely. So the East Med, I guess, like we have good news about Turkey and, and uh, Greece sitting on the table. They have a summit on the 25th of January. Uh, let's see what uh, it's always good. It's always good to sit on the table and communicate, talk, even if nothing comes out of it. But it's good to keep on uh, sitting on the table instead of going and sending the Navy to the uh, to the to the waters. So that is, that is important news. Lebanon, Israel, negotiations over the border, maritime border and the EEZ. This is something that we will be watching. Uh, there, are, there is an inter interesting turning point. Lebanon is claiming the Karish field being half for, for it, uh, for uh, uh, ownership of it, or at least like having, um, um, having uh, they're claiming that they have half of that Karish uh, field that is going to produce soon energy and has put more than $2 billion dollars in that field, so this is something to watch how this will be, uh, this, uh, this will turn out. Again, Qatar, I think Qatar will, Qatar not only about the, rappro uh, the rapprochement with the Arab world on the Gulf, I think, are we going to see a, a Qatar-Israeli peace deal? Is it going to happen 2021? This is very important. We always know that Qatar-Israel had relations uh, and economic ties, etc. but will it be in the open now? And that will be uh, that will put more pressure on Saudi Arabia to uh, go ahead with that because then it will be really like the region will prosper. And this is what I'm I'm looking for. Like this will be at least my my thing to look for for the coming ten years for the decade. How this region will turn to be one united and with a lot of uh, economic pros uh, prospects. So this is my and my other theory. I guess that I will be watching to see if I'm right or wrong. It's like, yes, it's true that Trump is leaving the White House, but I have a feeling that Trump, uh, uh, Trump and Jared Kushner will be, uh, will be in, the, in the region a lot, in the Middle East. And the well, the I, I, mean, the I, I, don't, I don't want to start a rumor, but apparently Trump is getting a house right next to Pervez Musharraf at Emirates Hills, you know, in a, you the, the, the lineup of former uh, authoritarian leaders around the world. We, we, we'll give them a, a yeah. palace. So because I don't like I see, you know, they, they, they've developed the deal of the century, hoping that that would be the U.S. Uh, policy in the region and it failed but I don't think that Trump and Jared Kushner want to see that failing as a business case for them and the business model so I think that the gang will come back and we'll see them at least in the Middle East we don't see them in the White House I think they will be tweeting from the Emirates I guess about all these projects that they will be investing in with their well, I do remember at the beginning of the uh, of the uh, presidency or somewhere around that time just up the road from uh, my house there was a Trump uh, a Trump branded housing estate uh, that was being built under, I mean, under his brand license that they took down at the time. I can't remember what the reason at that time was, but it was something to do with whatever he had insulted. Maybe it was the Muslim ban on travel or something. But anyway, that's the crack. 
the last day of Trump more or less looks like the first day. Uh, uh, and um, uh, we look forward to what a, a new year brings with a new administration for not only America, but for the world. Uh, obviously, there's no shortage of challenges. But what we have very uh, interesting is an interview now coming up with the Mr. Tellurian, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Sharif Suki, who of course is Lebanese and the founder of Chenier and, and probably one of the great visionaries on uh, global LNG. Uh, so he's had some very useful insights on obviously where LNG pricing has gone in the last few months and where it could go in 2021. But that's a wrap, a little over time today. Laurie, Bora, Matt, welcome back to the table. We look forward to you joining us through the season ahead and thank you for your time. All the best. Thanks, thank Sean. you, thank you, bye-bye.